The Shubin Talks Next Generation Imaging Higher Frame Rate is presented by SVG, the Sports Video Group, advancing the creation, production, and distribution of sports content at sportsvideo.org. Welcome to the Shubin video series on Next Generation Imaging. This one is on higher frame rates or HFR. Now, why should we even care about frame rates, the number one reason throughout the development of motion imaging was flicker perception. Here you see a white square and a black square, and if we flash back and forth between them, you can see them kind of flickering. But if we were able to flash back and forth fast enough, you would just see gray. And in fact, the screen that you're looking at is probably flashing right now. If you're under a fluorescent lamp, then you're probably not seeing flashing, but the lamp is flashing maybe 100 times a second or 120 times a second, depending on where in the world you are. Now, the perception of flicker is based on the frequency of the flicker, how fast it changes, or the frame rate, the angle of view, the brightness and contrast, how adapted you are to darkness, uh, there are a few other factors as well, but in traditional movies, there's a very big screen, and so it's filling a large portion of your field of view, and there's a low frame rate. We'll get into the frame rate for movies later, and there was blackness between the frames, and that's why movie theaters have traditionally been very dim. Uh, traditional television, the frame rate has come from the power frequency because in the early days of television, people were concerned that there would be leakage from the power supply and it would mess up the pictures unless the frame rate was the same as the power frequency, or the image rate anyway. So here's traditional moving image display illumination. On the left you see a movie projector, it's got a two-bladed shutter, um, the film is coming down 24 frames per second, but the shutter is rotating, so you're actually seeing 48 images per second. And in a uh, traditional picture tube, or old-style picture tube, the decay of the phosphors to 10% of their brightness happened very, very quickly, about um, 10 millionths of a second, and so that would also present flicker unless the frame rate or the image rate was high enough. So flicker was tied to the image presentation rate. But today we watch typically LCD TVs and they have a backlight that is um, flickering much faster than we can notice. Or if we go to a movie theater, we're looking at uh, digital light processing, which has very high frequency modulation, so we're not noticing the flicker of that. Uh, if we go to a stadium and we watch an LED display, or maybe at home or on a phone, we're looking at an uh, organic LED display in OLED. Um, those have adjustable frequencies, but they're made faster than the flicker rate, so the flicker rate is no longer tied to the image presentation rate. So what's the second reason to care about frame rate? Well, apparent motion. Um, what you're seeing at the bottom right is something that looks like a dot that's going around. That's happening at six frames per second, and if you think that it's because of the dots in a circle that you're seeing that, I recommend you go to this website of the Franklin Institute. It's bit.ly slash low hyphen fr, as in low frame rate. And that's a page where you can experiment with 1, 5, and 15 frames per second. 15 is certainly adequate for presenting apparent motion. 5, you might decide, is adequate for presenting apparent motion. 1 is not. So what else do we care about for frame rate? Well, there's motion correctness and smoothness. Uh, you may be familiar with the wagon wheel effect in old Western movies. It looks like the wheel is going the wrong way from the way that the carriage is moving. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend you go to this website, uh, bit.ly slash bad hyphen motion, and you'll be able to see the wagon wheel effect. And if you smooth that out, if you correct for the wagon wheel effect, 
by doing filtering, and I'll explain the filtering in a moment, then you might miss fast events. So let's see what that's about. An alias in uh, the criminal world is a false name, and we're familiar with aliases in pictures too when there's a diagonal line that looks like a flight of stairs or a curved line that looks like that. Those are aliases too because they're false. They're not what it's supposed to look like. Well, it's also possible to have aliases in motion imaging. So here is a picture of Paris in 1838, uh, Boulevard du Temple, and um, this might be the first photograph of a person, but notice that the whole boulevard appears to be empty. It's like Paris after the explosion of a neutron bomb. Well, it's not because of a neutron bomb, it's because of very long exposure in this photograph. So here I've put a, a little red box around the person, and there you see him, he's having his shoe shined. Now the person who's having his shoe shined, you can see him standing, you can see his leg bent over, that's how we know it's a person. You may not be able to make out the person who's doing the shoe shining because um, that person is moving too fast. But just to show that this isn't an effect of a blurry image, now I'm showing a window that's in the image, and you can see it's extremely clear. You can make out the curtains behind it and so on. So the exposure was affecting only things that moved rapidly. So what else do we care about in frame rate? Well, things that interact with motion smoothness. So here are two images that were shot by uh, the BBC in some of their research into high frame rate. And notice that in both of the images, the tracks and the ties and even the surface that the um, tracks and ties are on have identical sharpness. But the one on the left was shot at an exposure of about a 50th of a second, uh, 50 frames per second, and the one on the right had uh, about 300 frames per second. And you can see that the locomotive is clearly much sharper in the one on the right. So long exposure gives you very smooth motion, uh, but short exposure gives you high dynamic resolution or sharper pictures. Well, um, how can you achieve the short exposure? There's two possibilities. You could uh, use a shutter, but if you use a shutter, then you may get a motion alias. Uh, or something that shouldn't be in the motion, we call it judder. It's a word, it's a combination of jitter and shudder. But if you do that, there's no increase in the data rate. So you're sacrificing the smooth motion, but you're getting nice sharp pictures um, and no increase in data rate. Or you could do it by going to a higher frame rate, in which case there's no inherent uh, motion judder, but you do get an increased data rate. If you use a frame rate that's twice as fast, then you have twice as much data that you have to deal with. Now another option is at the display to use some sort of in-betweening or processing in-between. Uh, it means more computation, but you're shooting at the same data rate. You might get incorrect motion if some event happens between frames, and some TV sets are already doing this. Now, I should point out that there's a very exciting area of research, exciting to me, uh, going on right now on the possibility of having frame-free imaging. Um, and if you're interested in that, I recommend this website, bit.ly slash IBM Retinal. So we have two types of resolution that we're dealing with in uh, frame rate. One is dynamic resolution, how sharp the picture looks um, if it's moving, and that's based on the shutter or the frame rate. And then there's temporal resolution, which is what um, moments of time we can see, and that's based on the frame rate, because if you use a short shutter, you might be missing an event. Now, BBC has done some research that shows some source material, like someone juggling Indian clubs, you might want to go as high as 300 frames per second to see that very clearly. 
uh, NHK, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, has demonstrated very high resolution pictures at 60 frames per second versus 120 frames per second. That's the picture that you're seeing here. Um, the, what the camera is aimed at is a little moving band of images, and then at the right there's a display with the 60 and the 120. But if you glanced from that display over to the band, even 120 was not as clear as the original. So not sure what the uh, ideal frame rate is going to be. Now the European Broadcasting Union showed this chart at the International Broadcasting Convention in 2013. And what they found is that for every doubling of frame rate, they had a full grade of improvement um, that viewers perceived. Um, this is based on content that had a tremendous amount of motion in it. So just for comparison, if you uh, went to 4K, the EBU released some information, and I show that in the presentation on uh, higher spatial resolution. And 4K um, from HD is a much smaller improvement, maybe at best about half a grade, and it takes roughly eight times the data rate to do that half a grade. So that's 16 times the data rate per grade of improvement, and higher frame rate is just twice the data rate per grade of improvement. Now there's also interactivity between higher spatial resolution, uh, higher dynamic range, and high frame rate. Uh, I described this in the introduction, but again, if you describe motion in terms of pixels per second, then if you increase the number of pixels, you have to increase the frame rate to have the same number of pixels per second that are traversed. That's what the chart at the uh, lower left shows. And then the diagram on the right shows that if you increase the contrast, and you're at the edge of visibility of motion artifacts, then you're going to make the motion artifacts more visible. And so you need higher frame rate when you increase the dynamic range as well. You might notice that in some high dynamic range demonstrations. Now the Hobbit, uh, when it came out, was sometimes shown at 48 frames per second, but also sometimes shown at 24 and it was shown with image repetition, as is typical in movies, and uh, it was shown stereoscopically in 3D, and there was a typical alternate view 3D. And some reviews from some people mentioned a sort of queasiness, and some mentioned that the look of The Hobbit affected their ability to suspend disbelief. Now, some people think there is a storytelling issue if you increase the frame rate above around 40 frames per second. The Hobbit, remember, was 48. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, I recommend this website. It's bit.ly slash 48 hyphen FPS for frames per second. But there are other reasons why The Hobbit might have looked like that. The queasiness might have been due to overhead spinning shots. It might have been related to stereoscopic viewing issues. And as for look affecting uh, the ability to suspend disbelief, there's been a long history where some people say sound is going to mess up pictures. Some people say color will mess up pictures. Some people say 3D will mess up pictures. Um, so we nevertheless live in an era of sound and color and occasional 3D. But it's not just The Hobbit. There was a director who was interviewed in American Cinematographer magazine in August 1994 and he said that he concluded that 60 frames per second was too vivid and lifelike for a traditional fiction film. Becomes invasive. And he said, for conventional movies, it's best to stay with 24 frames per second. And who was that director? It was Douglas Trumbull. And here he is at the 2011 Technology Summit on Cinema, where he is promoting high frame rate. He's now a, a big fan of high frame rate. So again, times change. We've added sound and color, and we may go to high frame rate. By the way, there is absolutely nothing sacred perceptually about 
24 frames per second. It was chosen by Stanley Watkins, who was an employee of the Western Electric Company, um, for creating the Vitaphone sound process. And the motors that were going to be used for sound needed a single rate. It didn't really matter what that rate was, but it had to be a single rate. So Watkins asked the chief Warner Brothers projectionist what rates were used, and the projectionist said, well, you know, it went anything from 80 to 90 feet per minute in the best first-run movie theaters and anything from 100 feet per minute on up, depending on how many shows people wanted to get in at uh, the smaller theaters. And so they settled on 90 feet a minute as a compromise, and 90 feet a minute is 24 frames per second for four perforation 35 millimeter film. And that's where 24 frames per second came from. There's absolutely nothing sacred about it. Now, in sports or other high motion material, a higher frame rate can be uh, desirable. There is some bad news. If you go to a higher frame rate, there's a shorter exposure. So if you double the frame rate, then you have half the exposure, and that means you need more light or more sensitive cameras if you don't have more light and it also increases the data rate. If you double the frame rate, you double the data rate, and that reduces the amount of content that you can store, and it requires faster processing in the camera and in everything that follows it. But the good news is you get increased dynamic resolution, which means you get sharper pictures without having to go to a higher frame rate. You get increased temporal resolution, which means you're able to see shorter events, and for delivery to the home, the compressed data rate is going to be okay. It may not be the same as what you're using today, but it's not going to be double for a doubling of the frame rate because there's less change between the frames and the frames themselves are sharper. So let me just point out other videos in this series include one on higher dynamic range and why it's not the same as bit depth, uh, one on higher spatial resolution, like 4K, 8K, and uh, the introduction to next generation imaging. Thank you for watching and please enjoy the other videos.